infection, infection control in traumatic back injury. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to talk with you about in, for the general management of infection control. Of course, this is a broad subject, so um, this is my declaration of interest. Uh, I picked some specific uh, infectious problems in, uh, for the TBI population uh, at the intensive care unit, uh, which I want to discuss with you. So first to start with traumatic skull fractures, with or without uh, CSF leak, so cerebral spinal fluid leak. Um, uh, so there's a Cochrane uh, Library review on this, 2015, which has been updated every five years, uh, not the last time, in 2020, and it shows that uh, when you have a, a skull-based fracture in uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, that uh, using prophylactic antibiotics uh, does not help. These, uh, this is based on five small cl randomized clinical trials in 208 patients, so very limited data. Uh, level of evidence is moderate to low, but what we have in terms of randomized clinical trials is uh, that the advice is not to start prophylactic antibiotics. Even when you do a sub-analysis based on whether there is CSF leak or no uh, cerebral spinal fluid leak, then still the advice, there's no signal that it helps in terms of uh, mortality. So another issue is FAP, ventilator-associated pneumonia. What can we say about that? Um, I will discuss uh, on two occasions this review. So now first for the subject of uh, the ventilator-associated pneumonia. This is an uh, infection prevention in narrow intensive care unit systematic review. And it's a review on interventions to reduce infections in neurosciences, critical care units. And it included randomized clinical trials or before, after intervention trials. Uh, and the main outcome was ICU acquired infection, all sorts. And I will pick some issues from this review to illustrate uh, the subjects of this talk. Um, so ventilator associated pneumonia um, regarding um, uh, the prophylactic antibiotics, there are two short, there are two randomized clinical trials that use a short course or single dose of antibiotics. Um, and actually it did reduce very significantly the incidence of FAP, like 50 to 24 percent, but there were no effect on other clinical outcomes uh, based on these uh, two randomized clinical trials. So there are very limited data to base your policy on, but there's no strong evidence that we should give the antibiotics. Uh, this is another meta-analysis looking at incident risk factors and outcomes of uh, FAP, uh, showing the cumulative incidence of 36 uh, percent, and longer ICU length of stay was associated with, with FAP, which is not a big surprise, of course, and uh, when prospective studies also uh, showed a higher risk of uh, FAP and the TBI severity was a bit surprisingly not related to, uh, to FAP. And when you look at the associations of FAP with mortality, actually there is none, uh, but mechanical ventilation duration and ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay uh, is increased due to FAP. So no effect on clinical outcomes so much, but uh, effect on length of stay, which is imaginable. But, and, and it's still uh, an important outcome, I think. So this is a study by Chiara Roba, who's also the next uh, speaker from the Center TBI study, showing that FAP is actually a little bit lower incidence, uh, between 10, 10 and 20 percent. But I have to say that in the Center TBI, there were a lot of uh, mild TBIs admitted to ICU. This is probably the, uh, uh, the reason why FAP is a, has a lower incidence. Um, and uh, uh, factors associated with having uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia are depicted here. So chest trauma, which is uh, imaginable that that antibiotic prophylaxis also was protective in this analysis. Uh, H2 receptor antagonists were actually predictive of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, and males had a higher incidence. Strangely, a higher H seemed to be protective for a bit unclear reasons. When you look at the FAP patients in this study and the non-FAP patients, there were no very large differences in, uh, in oxygenation. Um, and uh, also, that was a confirmation of what was found in the randomized clinical trials that was, that, or, or the systematic review that was published uh, approximately uh, at the same time. Um, and these results were consistent that FAP did not impact on mortality or neurological outcome at six months. So this, mind you, this was a large prospective study. 
confirming this, but also the, uh, in the study it was found there's a longer duration of mechanical ventilation. It even doubled with, uh, with a FAP. So it's, FAP is important, I think, uh, to be able to prevent it because it might impact on your length of stay especially, which is uh, especially with the uh, tight capacity in ICUs is very re uh, relevant, I think. When you look at other interventions to uh, prevent uh, uh, FAP, uh, the uh, uh, in small intestinal feeding with a, uh, a small intestine tube uh, as opposed to gastric feeding tube might also help, uh, as was found in this uh, systematic review. Fair quality of included randomized clinical trials. Some were not of high quality, but some were. Uh, and it was also find, found that uh, FAP had a reduced incidence when you start early with uh, uh, small intestinal feeding. Another very small trial from uh, uh, Turkey uh, showed that when you look at the tube cuff pressure um, intermittently, as is now done in most clinics, versus continuously with a device that measures the cuff pressure uh, continuously, that the uh, continuous cuff pressure control might uh, impact on uh, colonization with gram-negative bacteria in your, um, in your tracheal aspirate and that also uh, the CPIS, which is the score indicating the level that you comply with the uh, criteria of having a FAP. Um, so a higher CPIS score is, uh, is actually indicative of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, and that seemed to help also. So I think cough pressure, this is an indication that cough pressure might also be more important than we have previously uh, thought. So then what about the uh, CSF drains associated uh, in TBI? and the infections. So this is a general systematic review on how do you uh, diagnose it. Actually, in this systematic review, there was a low proportion of traumatic brain injury, only 13%. But I think the signal is clear that several items in the liquor, so uh, in the CSF, protein concentration, glucose concentration, leukocytes, CRP, they are different, of course, um, in the ventriculitis group, but they are not very discriminative. So you cannot you should look at, the, at all the uh, variables to see if you think there's an uh, ventriculitis or an infection, but none of the criteria is really 100% uh, discriminative to, uh, to see if there's an infection. Um, so that also counts for gram staining and cultures, uh, increased leukocytes counts. There are differences, but discrimination is not perfect. Um, so back to the systematic review on uh, infection prevention in neurointensive care unit. Uh, so this is regarding prophylactic antibiotics uh, and how to prevent uh, EVD infections. Uh, well, prophylactic antibiotics in external ventricular drains, there's actually not much uh, evidence. Uh, and uh, the results are uh, contrary. So uh, some studies say that it might help and others say it does not help. But what is interesting is this, in this systematic review is that you, when you apply bundled care, and there are quite a lot of observational studies uh, applying bundles to prevent um, CSF drain, external CSF drain infections, uh, then you see a clear signal that it might help. So when you do a lot of things uh, together, uh, a bit similar to the central venous line, central venous line bundle uh, infection prevention measures, uh, so like antibiotic covered or silver uh, covered EVDs, or occlusive dressing at the site of insertion of the uh, uh, EVD, or bringing or inserting the EVD at the OR as opposed to at the ICU. Uh, these are all measures and, and not daily sampling uh, as a routine. These are all measures that together um, seem to be uh, strongly preventative for infections. Uh, so that's interesting and can be, I think, quite easily implemented. Regarding the intracranial pressure monitors, there's uh, no clear evidence of benefit of prophylactic antibiotics. However, uh, in spite of the fact that the uh, prophylactic antibiotics, there's no evidence and no clear signal from the literature, in the Center TBI, we found that uh, prophylactic antibiotics in Center TBI centers, so over 60 uh, uh, trauma centers, they applied it in 43% uh, and um, uh, in 55% for ventricular catheters. But it was only a single gift, which is not what was uh, studied. Uh, and can continued antibiotic prophylaxis uh, uh, are given uh, in a very low rate, like 8% and 11%. So that's more in line with the current evidence. Uh, 
So um, within Center TBI, we did also the group from Rotterdam uh, two studies on um, ventricular drainage catheters to measure ICP uh, versus intraparenchymal uh, catheters to monitor ICP and to see uh, not so much what was the effect on outcome, but um, uh, we also studied outcome, but also on ICU stay in infections. And uh, in the systematic review, we found that ICU stay tended to be longer in the patients that were managed with ICP catheters via uh, ventricular drainage catheters, um, and infection, com uh, infection rate went up, which is imaginable, of course, because uh, these patients have a, a port d'entrée for, uh, for bacteria in the, in the CSF. And this is actually from, uh, from our group also the study, a comparative effectiveness study from the real-time data from the Center TBI study. And we could not uh, confirm the infection uh, uh, risk because we, we, uh, we also did not have a lot of data on that, but it was not significantly increased, the infection risk, but there was a stronger incidence of a delayed uh, hematoma uh, in the group with, uh, with the EVD. Um, and length of stay also increased in this uh, analysis, in instrumental variable analysis. So there seems to be an indication that EVD indeed also, same like FAP, which is not comparable of course, leads to a longer length of stay and has no outcome benefit uh, and might lead to more infectious complications. Um, this is uh, another uh, study from a nationwide inpatient sample analysis. Uh, instant of meningitis uh, in uh, external CSF drainage in TBI patients. They, uh, this is in, uh, in a subset of almost 2,000 patients, so a fairly large uh, study. Uh, and it was found that predictors of EVD infections are H, AIDS, renal failure, uh, CSF leak, or renorrhea, uh, and sepsis. And uh, in the course of 10 years, between 2002 and 2001, there was actually not a decrease of the incidence of CSF infections, which was generally low, uh, around 5%. So then, a last word on post-operative neurosurgical infections. Of course, the TBI patients have surgery once in a while. Um, also, several risk factors, steroids, which some patients have, but most uh, don't, CSF leak, so um, this is definitely a risk factor for postoperative meningitis. Of course, when you have a CSF leak, you should not give the antibiotics because they are just the studies that I showed. But of course, when CSF remains, uh, CSF uh, leak does not stop, of course, that's a different situation because then you have to uh, consider starting antibiotics or even surgeries because then when there's a large hole in the, in the dura, uh, that might be a reason to perform surgery. There are some studies on that also. And also, uh, EVD is clearly a risk factor for meningitis, which is not uh, surprising. But again, in this uh, uh, study on post-operative meningitis, is not a reason to be pessimistic when a patient has meningitis uh, post-operatively because it has no impact on outcome. If you want to predict post-operative meningitis, this is a, a nice study done to validate prediction model based on uh, subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage uh, a blood on the CT scan, CSF leak, also a risk factor for postoperative meningitis, which is uh, quite logical, uh, CRP in the blood, CSF neutrophils, uh, and a lactate of more than four millimoles per liter. There are more studies on that showing that it's associated with indeed bacterial infections in the liquor, um, and uh, CSF serum glucose ratio of below uh, 0.4. And when you sum up these factors, and you put them in a, in a score list, then uh, a score of above four is highly predictive of a postoperative meningitis. Um, I don't use this uh, skill in clinical practice, but it's, uh, I think it's a nice study to see if there's a, a large risk in your patient. So are, are there any supporting guidelines on infection control measures in uh, TBI patients at the ICU? Uh, there are very little. This is a nice analysis, a review, and uh, from an Italian consensus. Uh, and indeed, it's in line with the data I showed that FAP for comatose TBI patients uh, um, uh, not recommended to give uh, prophylactic antibiotics to prevent FAP, although it might work. And of course, we don't have the study using uh, studies using a longer course of antibiotics, like for a week. Those randomized control haven't been done, but maybe they have a larger impact. We don't know. Uh, an antibiotic for scale-based fractures uh, is advised uh, against.
in the BTF guidelines 2016-2017, um, it is indeed also in line with the data I already showed that transgastric jejunal freedom is recommended to reduce incidence of uh, FAP and antimicrobial impregnated catheters may be considered to prevent catheter-related infection during uh, external CSF drainage, but I, I think it's, it's, um, it's good to see if you can have more measures to prevent CSF infections uh, in external ventricular catheters, because this is one, just one measure, and as, as, as I've shown, there are more measures that you can put in a bundle and that, that might be more effective. It depends on, um, also on background infection rate in your ICU. So in conclusion, infection control and TBI, don't give antibiotic for skull fractures or, or FAP. Uh, FAP has an impact on ICU duration, especially consider early jejunal feeding and mind the cough pressure, which might be important uh, to prevent FAP. Uh, EVD infections might be preventable with care bundles uh, and might decrease length of stay at the ICU when you do that. Um, and uh, guideline uh, recommendations are quite limited on these infectious uh, issues. Thanks for your attention. Thank you again for this very nice lecture. And uh, do we have questions from the audience? So I would like to ask uh, whether there is any sub-analysis because there can be no main analysis. I don't, uh, I'm not aware of such papers, but the, whether there is a sub-analysis on uh, the occurrence of ARDS, on the effect of interventions, for example, prophylactic antibiotics, on the occurrence of ARDS in uh, traumatic brain injury, which is very problematic because, you know, of them, you have to manage the PCO2 on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have to use protective ventilation. So, it's really problematic to have an ARDS patient after uh, traumatic brain injury. Your question but is what the effects of antibiotics? Of the effect of prophylactic antibiotics on the occurrence of ARDS, not that. I, I'm not aware of any studies, but to be honest, I didn't search for this lecture. Maybe I should have, so it's a very good question. Uh, but, but I don't know if there are studies. I don't, I don't think there are, but um, I'd, have to, uh, I'd have to check. So we agree that uh, there is need for such data, right? Because I think that, uh, well, it's a reasonable outcome. Because yeah, well, the situation the, is quite problematic. A, a good discussion point is how, how often do we see ARDS in these patients? Um, to be honest, in, in, in my practice, I don't see it that often, in, in, uh, also not in multi-trauma patients, of course, depending on how good you, you, you watch the occurrence of ARDS, probably. But um, uh, of course, we do have ARDS, but it, it's quite rare in, in my experience. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it's easy to do studies when the incidence is, is variable between ICUs. But I think it's an important thing to study, of course, especially in a combination that you, you, there are opposing uh, goals in the management of ICP and, and mechanical ventilation, which, is, which can be a problem, of course. It could be reasonable to start uh, prophylactic antibiotics when you have a severe traumatic brain injury, but uh, this, is, uh, this is not evidence-based. I, I did try to look at selective decontamination at the, uh, of the digestic, uh, uh, digestive tract, which is kind of a Dutch invention. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, all ICUs use uh, selective decontamination of the digestive uh, tract, but there are no specific studies on TBI. These, these patients must have been in the large trials from the Netherlands on the effect uh, on ICU outcomes in, uh, uh, in ICUs, but... Um, Maybe we should ask the others to look at the TBI specifically, what was the effect there, because I, I don't have these data. They're not published. So I would like to thank you very much.